Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 76 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Ahoy! I hope you're ready to consider a life at sea, because today we're going to explore maritime life during the Age of Revolutions. So you better get your sea legs and time travel legs ready, because we're going back in time to between 1760 and 1815. As we chart our course through what life was like for sailors during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, we're also going to investigate how early Americans and early modern Europeans thought about citizenship, because citizenship and how to prove it was an important issue that many early American sailors had to think about. So as you can tell, we have a lot to explore today, but that's okay because we have a very capable guide. The captain for our exploration is Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, who, although he's not actually a sea captain, he is an assistant professor of history and spatial sciences at the University of Southern California. During our exploration, Nathan reveals what daily life was like for American sailors during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, details about privateer, merchant, naval, and fishing vessels, and what it meant to be a citizen of a nation during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and how early American sailors attempted to prove their citizenship to the United States. But before we cast off on our adventure, have you considered becoming a member of the Ben Franklin's World Movement? Just like the adventurers of old, who used to support and finance explorations and missions to North America during the 16th and 17th centuries, you could help support this podcast and its mission to restore history to the forefront of the public mind. For more information about how you could become a Ben Franklin's World crowdfunder, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash movement or text support BF World to 33444. All right, my friend, our anchor's away and I've charted our course. So let's get our weekly historical adventure underway. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history and spatial sciences at the University of Southern California. He is interested in the political and cultural history of the Atlantic world during the first age of revolutions, which took place between 1760 and 1815. Today, he joins us to discuss his first book, Citizen Sailors, Becoming American in the Age of Revolution. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Nathan Pearl Rosenthal. Thanks so much, Liz. I'm delighted to be here. Today, we're going to talk a lot about American identity and sailors. So why don't we start our conversation with sailors? In Citizen Sailors, Nathan charts the role American seamen played in defining American citizenship between the American Revolution and the War of 1812. Nathan, would you tell us what daily life was like for American sailors in the late 18th and early 19th centuries? Well, life for sailors in that period was not an easy one. I think a lot of people would think that life for sailors in almost any period is not an easy one. As you know, they live primarily on the water and we're land-based creatures. And so a lot of their lives uh, and their sort of daily lives are worked around this effort of trying to survive on these little islands of wood and tar and uh, rope out on the ocean. So one thing that you can say about the daily life of a sailor at sea uh, is that it's continuous. The work is almost continuous. Um, there's hardly any time during the day except when they're actually asleep that they're kind of at rest or just sort of doing whatever. They're almost always working the sails, cleaning. Sometimes they'll be picking oakum, so they're sort of making uh, stuff to repair the ship or reseal the ship, fishing for food. So there's a kind of continuous activity aboard ship. Um, it's a hard life. And you can see that in the fact that sailors, by and large, in this period are young men, mostly. They're in their teens, 20s, 30s. The vast majority of them are in that, that age range. And, you know, it's partly because older sailors have difficulty doing the work. So that's their life at sea, the daily life at sea. On shore, you see a life which is, by and large, on the margins of society, in towns where sailors are from, the sort of towns that have a lot of sailors, 
places like Salem or Marblehead or even New York or Charleston, you have a lot of sailors, but they're almost always at the very bottom of the socioeconomic pyramid. Um, they're relatively poor. They have you know, relatively small numbers of kind of consumable goods by comparison to their fellow, their fellow citizens. So, you know, it's not an easy life by any means. It sounds like early American sailors engaged in backbreaking work that few men would want to undertake. So the interesting thing is, what brings men to sea, and there's been a lot of research about this, what brings men to sea isn't necessarily desperation. It's that there are these families and entire communities that over generations are in the maritime trade. So if you are born in 1790, you can imagine yourself as being born in 1790 in Salem, Massachusetts, you have a really good chance of having a parent, a father, or a close relative who was a seafarer, and you were yourself quite likely to go to sea. So it's not that you have a lot of the kind of traditional image of the runaway from land who goes to sea. There are those too, but a lot of the men who go to sea are men who are from seafaring families who've actually been seafaring for, for generations. And one of, the, one of the things about their lives is that because this is a young man's game, right, or a career for people in their 20s and 30s primarily, it often serves as a kind of phase of life for a lot of sailors. Not all, but for a lot of sailors, they'll go to sea for 15, 20, 25 years. And if they survive, which is not a given at all, death rates are something like 30% over that period at sea, they'll then go be back on shore in their later life in some other profession. But you know, these, are all, these are all hard physical labor professions. So, yeah, no, it's, it's certainly not an easy life, but it is a life which is passed on in many cases in, in families uh, and communities for generation to generation. When we think of early America, many of us think of the urban port towns along the Atlantic seaboard. Do we have any idea how many Americans are serving in the seafaring trades and, and what the demographics of that American community is like? Yeah, so we have a pretty good idea, actually. And what's striking about sailors, and I, I always talk about this when I, when I start talking about sailors, this is usually where I start, is to say, well, why should we study sailors as historians? Because there really aren't that many of them as a social grouping in the 18th or early 19th centuries. So even in, in the aggregate, in the populations, even of nations or regions that are totally dependent on seafaring, so places like England, London, even the North American colonies, which you know live off of their trade, sailors are usually no more than about 2% of the overall population. So it's a really small percentage. It's a bit higher in port cities, in those big eastern port cities. But even there, I, I don't believe it ever goes much north of 20 or 25% of the population. So then, you know, the second part of your question is, well, who are these guys? And that depends on where you are. It depends based on what area of the world you're in. In North America, which is what we're talking about mostly today, the seafaring population is actually quite mixed racially, ethnically. You have quite a lot of black seamen. Uh, in some ports, it goes as high as about 20% of the seafaring population is black men, which is quite remarkable as a percentage in any, uh, in any profession. And part of the reason why that's the case is that seafaring has no uh, legal barriers to entry for African Americans. African Americans are allowed to become seafarers, unlike some kind of artisanal labors, for instance. And it's also a kind of work that, as you suggested, those who are better off or might have other opportunities are unwilling to do. And so um, for African-Americans who are socially marginal, or some who are not socially marginal, but in places like Philadelphia or the South or New York, it's one of the professions where they can really find a way to earn a living and a good living um, that can support a family, can support themselves, support a family. You also see in some of the New England states, the Indian communities, the Native communities, have these long seafaring traditions, which are often well predate European contact. And so in some places you see, especially the whaling ports, you see a large um, Native population as part of the seafaring population. So it's, it's quite racially mixed. I don't mean to suggest that it's racially harmonious, but it is quite racially mixed, much more so than a lot of other professions in this, in this era. Yeah, it seems a bit unusual. It sounds like a very diverse profession. Does the fact that few people wanted to enter the seafaring trades mean that the sailors were paid well? No. In a word, no. Sailors are not particularly well paid, but that's only part one of the answer. They're not making a lot of money overall, but there are periods during which they get paid a lot more. So in wartime, for instance, sailors, especially who are engaged in trade, get paid a lot more because there's a labor shortage, because uh, you need sailors to serve in the Navy as well. And that increases the, their sort of negotiating power, basically, against captains and merchants. And also in the more dangerous trades, in some cases, you see sailors getting paid a bit more. So it's not work that over a lifetime pays very well, but there can be periods where you make a lot of money, or relatively speaking, a lot of money. The other thing to note is that privateering is one of the ways in which sailors can earn a lot more money 
so they can go out and get these sort of big paydays, basically. What is a privateer and what makes them different from merchant or naval vessels? Yeah, so I'm obsessed with privateers. I think they're totally fascinating. It's a phenomenon that has deep roots. It goes back to the Middle Ages, which becomes a big deal in the 17th and 18th century. So what it is basically, a privateer is essentially a legalized pirate, you can put it that way. Or in more formal terms, it's legalized commerce rating is what privateering is. So what that means in practice is that the king or sovereign of a country, let's say, let's just choose Britain as an example, gives a commission to, uh, usually to a merchant, who then uses it to equip a ship. And the commission permit allows him to go out in wartime, to send out an armed ship and capture enemy merchant vessels. And then they're brought back to Britain, let's say, and judged to determine whether they're actually enemy ships. And if they are enemy ships, if they're determined to be enemy ships, then he, the merchant, gets to keep most of the proceeds. He gets to he essentially acquires them as what's called valid prize. They basically become plunder for him. And so there's usually a division of the spoils between the merchant, the captain, the crew of the ship, and then also some of it usually goes to the crown. But so this is a system that you know, has, has, as I said, deep roots, but which develops into a much more robust part of European warfare in the 18th century, such that by the middle of the 18th century, every time these European powers go to war, Britain and France particularly, but there are lots of, you know, Spain as well, the Netherlands, hundreds of these privateers are dispatched from each of the belligerent powers, from each of the warring powers, who capture hundreds of merchant vessels. And the losses on each side go into what it would be the equivalent of millions and millions of dollars in, in today's money. So this is a system, basically, which allows European powers at war to attack their, their enemies' commerce, which is something that navies aren't very good at, to attack their enemies' commerce and to profit from it in wartime. So how safe is privateering? It sounds like it could be very lucrative, but there must be a downside to being a privateer. Oh, yeah, there is a big downside. The privateers are often, well, basically the model of a privateer is a fast ship, right? Because it needs to be fast to catch up with enemy merchant vessels. So you send out these fast ships to basically prey on merchant routes. So you look for places they sort of know usually where enemy merchant shipping is going to be passing through, and they go there and they try to capture as many of them as they can. A lot of the times, enemy merchant vessels will resist. So these privateers are heavily manned. A privateer of a certain size would have sometimes up to 10 times as many men aboard ship as a merchant vessel of the same size. So it's a lot of men. And a lot of the time, merchant vessels will just yield if they, you know, a privateer comes up to them and fires a warning shot, basically, and raises their flag and orders the merchant vessel to stop and be captured. But sometimes the merchant vessels fight back. And sometimes a privateer will attack a vessel that isn't a merchant vessel. It sometimes attacks another privateer, as you can imagine. And then you have these quite violent battles often in which, you know, there are sometimes significant casualties. In addition to that, the privateering vessels are usually rather small. They're supposed to be small and fast. So they're actually vulnerable themselves to attacks from enemy navies. So privateering is not safe at all. It's quite dangerous, or frequently quite dangerous, but it is quite lucrative because you get a share of the profit from this vessel. So just to give you an example, since you know, this all may sound a little abstract to you, I worked on a case of a privateer that captured a homebound British East Indiaman from India during the American Revolutionary War. And this ship had aboard it, among other things, six chests full of silver and gold completely full of silver and gold. And so there's, this is a huge payday for the sailors aboard these privateers. That's, of course, pretty exceptional. But nonetheless, it does happen. And that's kind of the dream of privateering is that you're going to capture one of these big ships um, and make a killing. Privateering could have a huge impact for war-waging nations. Would you tell us what impact privateering had during the American Revolution and War for Independence? Privateering has a very specific kind of impact on warfare in this period. Privateers are no use for doing the things that navies do. The things navies do is like they blockade ports, they attack other navies, and they have these very elaborate sort of set-piece battles with multiple ships engaged in rather complex maneuvers. That's not what privateers do. From the point of view of the state, what they do is they attack the economic foundation of the enemy's war-making power. So one of the important ways in which governments finance themselves in this period is through trade and the regulation of trade. And privateers, when you send out 100 privateers in wartime, part of the goal is to capture as many of these enemy merchant ships as possible and kind of cripple the enemy's economy. So it's a form of economic warfare, really. 
During the American Revolutionary War, it's especially important to the patriots, the American revolutionaries, because they don't have a navy that's really able to compete with the British Navy. They do actually have a navy. Some people don't think that's the case, but it's pretty clearly the case that there's a small American navy, the American Continental Navy. But it's really, it's small ships. They're not able to fight large British men of war. And so what the Americans are able to do on the water, effectively, is attack British merchant shipping. And they're perfectly positioned for this because the northern colonies, especially Massachusetts, Maine, are huge shipbuilding centers in the pre-revolutionary period. They have a huge stock of ships um, to draw on, and they equip hundreds of privateers and, 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 and attack British shipping. And so American privateers during the Revolutionary War are not only able to damage the British economy, but What's even better for them is that sometimes they get a twofer out of it. They'll often try to capture British supply ships carrying, for instance, military goods. So there are a lot of instances of privateers, for instance, capturing British vessels that carry guns, ammunition, uniforms, shoes, all of the things that the American patriots don't have and can't make for themselves. So it's actually quite important. A lot of the the equipment that the Continental Army uses, for instance, comes from privateers, from privateering captures. Okay, I think we have it. Privateers attack the economic foundation of an enemy's war-making capabilities, merchant ships carried out commerce, and naval vessels blockaded and besieged ports. So what was discipline in life like aboard these different vessels? Was it similar or different aboard different types of ships? That's a great question and a kind of central one for understanding the maritime world. And let me just add one more maritime world, um, which is the world of the fisheries, which is distinct from those three that you've just sketched. But what you've painted is basically four somewhat different maritime worlds with very different purposes and also very different, as you suggest, ways of living. So discipline really varies depending on what kind of maritime profession you're in. In the fisheries, by and large, discipline is relatively gentle, mostly because fishing ships, especially short distance fishing ships, are mostly equipped with relatives, with sort of families or friends. So the fisheries are very locally recruited. You have a lot of like cousins and uncles and friends of friends aboard fishing vessels. So these are relatively irenic kind of environments. The merchant vessels and privateers are much less recruited from face-to-face communities. And so you see a lot more conflict aboard those vessels, which can range from sort of petty theft and sort of minor insubordination, all the way up to the kind of cinematic, dramatic moments that we all know about of mutiny, of extreme violence by captains against their sailors, murder, etc. So it really varies. And then, of course, on the naval vessels, these are these huge vessels, uh, much larger than any of these other forms of vessels. So naval ships, the largest ones, carry hundreds of men, sometimes up to seven or 800. These are the size of villages in this period small towns even. And so they're governed in a rather hierarchical fashion. There are rather draconian rules that are in place to enforce discipline. And there you often see the sort of cinematic violence much more frequently. Probably in many naval vessels, you probably see that kind of cinematic violence, whippings of the masthead, things like that. You probably see that almost every week, um, which would not be the case in most merchant fishing or even privateering vessels. Now that we know about sailors and maritime life during the Age of Revolution, Let's transition our discussion to American identity. In Citizen Sailors, Nathan sets out to answer what gives someone the status of an American citizen and how does one tell whether or not a person has that status? He uses sailors as his case study to explore this issue. Nathan, what did it mean to be a citizen during the late 18th and early 19th centuries? That's a great question. It's a really important question because I think there's often confusion about what we mean when we talk about citizenship. In English, of course, the word citizenship means two rather different things, and it's important to be clear on the distinction. On one side, it means citizenship status. It means what we now call in modern parlance citizenship status, that is the fact of being a citizen. It also refers, though, to this other category of things, which is the the idea of citizenship as a bundle of rights, right? Citizenship as a set of rights that you have that you exercise as citizens. So, you know, today, things like rights of free assembly, rights of movement, free speech, et cetera, et cetera. And those are two rather distinct ways of talking about citizenship. And I'll give you an example of how they're different. If you think about children, for instance, today, right? Children are 
in the United States, let's say, are unambiguously citizens of the United States. They have U.S. citizenship status, but they don't exercise all of the rights of citizens. So that's, in the modern world, that's somewhat unusual. There are not that many categories of people who are citizens, but have a limited set of rights. Um, though there are other categories. Children are just the best example. In the 18th and 19th centuries, it's much more common to have citizenship status, but not to have all of the rights. So for instance, women, African Americans, the poor in many cases, lots of other categories of people have citizenship status in some cases, but aren't treated as citizens, don't have citizenship in the sense that they have all of the rights of citizens. So what I'm really interested in in my book is actually the question of citizenship status, because that's the thing that I think we don't know as much about, and which is really important for understanding the formation of the political community, who's inside it, who's outside of it. That's what I'm really dealing with in, in the book. Did different conceptions of citizenship exist in different places around the Atlantic world? Conceptions of citizenship vary enormously based on where you are in the Atlantic. And after American independence and the following sort of 50 years of the age of revolution, they become even more different around the Atlantic. So the biggest difference, the one that I think we're most familiar with, is the distinction that comes after 1776 between American concepts of citizenship and the concept of citizenship in most of the rest of Europe. And the difference is basically this. In the United States, one of the revolutionary transformations is the idea that citizenship is a choice. That is to say, you can choose to become a citizen of the United States if you fulfill certain criteria. We can say more about that. And if you're a citizen of the United States, and this is really remarkably radical, you can also choose to not be a citizen of the United States. You can renounce your citizenship. Now, this may all sound very familiar. This is kind of the way that it works pretty much everywhere in the world today. But in the 18th century, this is a pretty novel set of ideas because most everywhere else, especially in Britain and France, which are kind of the paradigms for this model. Once a subject, always a subject. The idea is what's called, is the notion of what's called indefeasible allegiance. That's what the British call it, a fancy word for saying basically once a subject, always a subject. If you were born a subject of the King of Great Britain, you will spend the rest of your life as a subject of the King of Great Britain. And it's very hard to become a subject of the King of Great Britain. And it's also almost impossible to renounce your subjecthood. So come 1776, um, and this is then something which spreads in, that becomes part of the French revolutionary model, the idea that citizenship is somewhat more voluntary. Um, you have a real divide in the Atlantic world between some countries, some empires that regard citizenship as, and subjecthood as a permanent quality that can't be changed, and others which allow you to change it. Are there differences between being a citizen and being a subject? I mean, how did Americans define and obtain citizenship before and after the American Revolution, because before the Revolution, they are subjects of the king, and after the Revolution, they are not. This is such an important question. This is such an important point. There is absolutely a transition. There's a huge difference between being a subject of the King of Great Britain and being a citizen of the United States from the point of view of the rights of citizens. The Bill of Rights is partly about trying to articulate some of the ways in which citizens of the United States have rights that they might not have had before. But from the point of view of citizenship status, actually, what's interesting is that there's very little change at all, right? There's still the notion of an inside and an outside. You are a citizen or you aren't a citizen just as before you were a subject or you weren't a subject. And that's kind of, that's a central point. So there is a real change in the nature of citizenship in 1776, but it's important to recognize that not everything changes, right? That there's still the idea of a kind of closed community, which is determined in part by the government. In his book, Citizen Sailors, Nathan also talks about common sense citizenship. Nathan, would you tell us what common sense citizenship was and how American, British, and French sea captains used this principle? So what I talk about is actually something that I call the common sense of nationality. And the idea here is that before 1776, there's this notion that people around the Atlantic world have, who are in working in the maritime world, uh, the notion that they have that you can kind of guess the citizenship status or the nationality, if you will, of mariners based on sort of looking at them and listening to them, that it's a kind of commonsensical judgment. And what I mean by that, and I'm, I'm borrowing this concept a little bit from a colleague of mine, Ariella Gross, who's written about the common sense of race in the 19th century. 
The idea here is that people have this notion that you can sort of look at people, listen to them, look at their dress, and basically make a good guess about what sovereign they belong to. Now, if you come back to the, what I was saying about privateering, this is really important to see because in wartime, one of the things that privateers have to do is make really quick judgments about whether the people on board ships that they're encountering are enemies or allies, right? Or in fact, subjects of their own monarch, because that determines whether they can actually capture this vessel or not. So they have this idea that you can make these decisions based on what seem to be kind of ephemeral qualities to us, you know, how you're dressed, what you sound like, but which to them, they think correspond pretty durably and reliably to a national identity or a nationality. There are similar but conflicting ideas of citizenship around the Atlantic world. So how did American sailors attempt to prove their version of citizenship to the United States? Right. So this problem, and this follows directly on the common sense of nationality, the common sense of nationality breaks down in 1776 because once there's this division of the Anglophone Atlantic world, the English-speaking Atlantic world into Americans and Britons, right, a political division, it becomes immediately impossible to tell who's a British sailor and who's an American sailor because they look and sound and dress exactly alike. And just a little parenthesis here, it's very clear that there aren't distinct accents, at least for sailors in this period, that you can't tell them apart. So this then creates a big problem for all mariners, but especially for American sailors who are citizens of the weaker power in this this war, uh, the American Revolutionary War, and then even more so in the French Revolutionary Wars, because they really have a lot of trouble demonstrating to anybody on the water that they're not Britain, because everyone kind of, it's easy to guess that they're Britain. So what do they do? They basically try to throw everything at the wall to prove that they're American. Um, and so the way I start the book off is with a story of a, an American sailor named Nathaniel Fanning, who is a privateersman who's actually serving aboard a French privateer. He's actually the captain of a French privateer during the American Revolutionary War. And he's captured by the British, and he's brought before a couple of judges who have decided you know, what he is. And he says a few words, and one of them says, oh, you're Irish. And the other one says, no, you're English. And Fanning says, no, 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 I'm an American. And of course, he has no papers to prove this. He's got nothing to demonstrate it. So what happens is that one of the two interrogators starts asking him a whole bunch of questions about the place that he came, claims to be from in America, about New London. And so he asks him, which way do you turn out of the harbor to get to Fisher's Island? Who was the collector of customs in the port before the Revolutionary War? And he asks him a whole series of questions. And when Fanning is able to answer them, he's convinced that Fanning is probably an American as he claims to be. But you've got all sorts of other ways that Americans during the Revolutionary War and in the decade after are trying to prove their Americanness. So you have just protestations. You have these Americans who've got lots of letters from American sailors saying, you got to believe me, I'm really an American. Um, you have Americans getting oaths, affidavits from other sailors, from their captains, attesting to the fact that they are in fact Americans. You have Americans getting certificates of various kinds from like the mayor of the city that they come from or from a local official of some kind. You even, in some cases, have Americans mounting these letter-writing campaigns back home to get relatives at home to write letters attesting to the fact that they are, in fact, um, American. So it's a very fluid moment, this sort of decade and a half after 1776, when American sailors, on the one hand, have a lot of trouble proving their American citizenship, but on the other hand, if they can do it, they have a lot of flexibility, right? Because there's not a sort of consistent way of proving your American citizenship. It sounds like Fanning and his fellow sailors created a lot of paperwork. I mean, you talked about affidavits and oaths and all these other documents they tried to get to prove their citizenship. Was there any form of formal identification paperwork from the United States telling the world that, hey, these guys belong to us? So you're absolutely right. There was all these different kinds of paperwork, and they are basically throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. And the problem is, all of these forms of paperwork, if you're a British naval officer or a French privateersman or a Dutch privateersman or a Caribbean customs official, it's really hard to figure out whether you should trust any of these pieces of paper because you don't know, for instance, who the, I don't know, the mayor of New York is necessarily. In fact, you probably don't, right? The sailor could just have written up a piece of paper claiming to have an affidavit from the mayor of New York or something. So the, there's a huge amount of paperwork being produced. And I should add, sailors are even uh, tattooing themselves as, I think, a form of identification as well. So you have a lot of t sailors doing, for instance, uh, tattoos of eagles, of sort of American national emblems. But it's really hard for officials out in the wider Atlantic world to have a lot of confidence 
in the reliability of these documents. And so that's ultimately where the American state comes in at the very end of the 18th century. The story that I tell in the latter half of the book is about the ways in which, after about 1793, when Britain and France begin this titanic sort of series of wars, the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, both sides, and these are wars that involve all of the European powers, both sides put incredible pressure on American sailors to prove themselves to be American. And in response, sailors, there's a sort of crisis of American nationality at sea. Basically, all of this paperwork, all of these affidavits, all of these oaths just don't cut the mustard in wartime for British or French officials. And so American sailors start getting into enormous trouble. You have hundreds of American ships captured, thousands of American sailors are being pulled into the British Navy. And at this point, American sailors, through merchants, who are, of course, their employers, basically petition the Congress to produce a system of nationality documentation, and Congress creates one in 1796. And this is the through what's called the Act for the Protection uh, of Seamen. And they create a system of national certificates, paper certificates of American nationality in 1796. I'm curious. You mentioned that if you're a Dutch or Spanish captain, why would you believe the papers that an American sailor hands you? I would like to know why they would distrust the old paperwork issued by local and state officers and trust the new paperwork issued by the new fledgling U.S. government. So if you're a Dutch or Spanish seaman, you kind of have to make a judgment call um, if you're out. So let's say you're a privateersman in 1794, right? And let's put you in the Caribbean, which is where there are a lot of privateersmen in this period. And for the sake of argument, let's, yeah, let's say you're Dutch. So you stop a ship filled with people who are speaking English, and you want to decide, are these Americans or are they Britain? So there's a bunch of paperwork aboard ship, just for the ship's papers, which probably give you some hint one way or the other. But you want to try to figure out whether the sailors themselves are American or British. If they're British, then they're enemy subjects, and the ship can be captured. If they're Americans, then it's a neutral ship, and it has to be let go. If you're a privateersman, and we've already talked about privateering, right, as I was saying, there's a lot of money to be made in privateering, you might be inclined to find a way to see these guys as British subjects, because that means you can capture the ship and maybe get it condemned and then maybe make some money off of the capture. So there's that reason, right? The kind of incentives for privateersmen are to find a way to capture the vessel. At the same time, though, you know, a lot of these papers, and I wish I could show you some of them while I'm telling you about them, some of these early kinds of paperwork really don't look that official, right? An affidavit is basically just a sheet of paper that says, I, so-and-so, notary public, had before me X person who testified that he is a citizen of the United States, and then it's signed. Anyone could produce one of these pieces of paper. It might have a seal on it of some kind, but it's not very reliable. What makes the federal government paperwork after 1796 a little bit more convincing is that it actually represents the state of the art of 18th century identity documentation. So I wish, again, I wish I could show you one of these, but if you can imagine it, it's a sheet of paper, sort of you know, it looks like an eight and a half by 11 sheet, a printed form. So it has usually the great seal of the United States or some version of it printed at the top. So, you know, an eagle with various things, you know, like on, the, on money. Then it has printed the name of the guy who issues it, the collector of customs, and it's got spaces to fill in for the name of the sailor and a physical description, et cetera. And then at the bottom, it says, is a citizen of the United States. And then it has a space for a signature and a seal, and it's also numbered. So these are documents which, if you are an 18th century person, when you see this, you understand that this represents kind of the most reliable kind of identity documentation that they can produce in this period. So that's what makes it more convincing in the moment. But what also makes it more convincing is that presumably most sailors out in the Atlantic Ocean have actually heard of the United States. They've heard of the federal government and they might be more willing to trust it than they are to trust, let's say, some mayor of some town that they've probably never heard of. Um, so there again, there's a kind of reliability. And then once you really start digging into it, because it's numbered and because it's connected, it's issued by a particular individual. If you wanted to, you can actually write to the person who issues the certificate and you can confirm that it's a real certificate. Good luck doing that with a certificate from the mayor of some town in Maine. I mean, that person is probably not the mayor anymore. It's not clear whom you write to. Um, so that makes a big difference, too. How do sailors go about obtaining this official paperwork from the United States government? So it's a fascinating process, and it's one that I think, I hope we will learn more about um, as, as some scholars really dig into some of the remaining paperwork of these customs houses. 
So the customs houses are these offices in most port cities and port towns, um, which are staffed by a U.S. government official, but who's sort of usually closely connected to the local merchant community. And what sailors do, and these are, these are in theory voluntary, and let me just say, although it's voluntary to get one of these certificates, they issue 20,000 of them in the space of the first less than 10 years that the certificates are available between 1796 and 1803, and it's 100,000 certificates by 1815. So pretty much every American sailor has one of these documents. So what you do if you're a sailor is you go down to the customs house with two kinds of documentation or proof of some kind. You need to have proof of your American citizenship, and the the possibilities are very wide. There are a lot of different kinds of documents that they accept. You can have, if you're a naturalized citizen, you can have your certificate of naturalization or a proof of naturalization. If you're native-born, an extract of a register of baptism or some other kind of birth documentation. But failing that, you can also have affidavits, let's say, from your parents. Um, or from childhood neighbors. Um, And then you have to have one other layer of documentation, which is you have to have affidavits confirming the authenticity of the documentation that you're producing of your citizenship, right? So you can't just show up with something and say it's a citizenship document. You also need to have proof that the citizenship document is in fact what you claim it is. So again, for the 18th century, this is a pretty sophisticated system of identity documentation. Is it possible to game the system? Absolutely. Is it much more reliable than a system where you just show up in the mayor's office and demand a certificate? Definitely. So you produce all this evidence, and sometimes you actually bring physical, actual friends as witnesses who will testify to the reliability of your evidence. The customs house clerks, you know, the guys who work there, take down your evidence. Sometimes they actually keep copies of it. And in fact, there are a few customs houses where we still have the copies of the proofs that are submitted. Nobody's really done a systematic study of that, but someone should. And uh, then they'll fill out this certificate for you, which, as I said, you know, will be numbered and have your physical description on it as a sailor, your name, and then the author- authorizing signature and seal. And then they'll keep a book in the customs house um, that has a list of all of these certificates that are issued. And that's your certificate, and then off you go. Earlier, we discussed the diversity in the seafaring trades. Jeannie would like to know if the United States government recognized African-American sailors as American citizens and whether the process by which African-American sailors would have obtained that citizenship paperwork differed from their white counterparts. This is, to me, one of the most amazing dimensions of this system of citizenship documentation. It is, in fact, completely open and available to African-American seamen. So that makes it one of the only places in revolutionary or even 19th century America until the Civil War, really, where African Americans have a clear path to unambiguous citizenship in the United States. There are a few other places where that's allowed, but this is really remarkable. This is a form of citizenship that's open to African Americans. And thousands of African Americans take advantage of this, African American sailors. I mentioned you know, the large percentages of African Americans in the seafaring trades. So thousands of, of African American sailors take advantage of this and get certificates for themselves. And we have the records of those citizenship applications. And the process, and this is again rather remarkable, the process for them is also the same as for a white sailor in theory. There's actually a remarkable exchange in the early 19th century where the collector of customs, the guy who issues these certificates in New Orleans, tries to start issuing different certificates to African Americans, ones that are not, that sort of don't say that they're citizens. And he actually gets a rebuke from the Secretary of State saying, you absolutely can't do this. You have to issue exactly the same kind of certificate to African Americans as to white sailors. So this is, again, this is coming from the highest levels of the federal government, not only recognition of African American citizenship, but an insistence that it be, you know, sort of in the same form as citizenship for white men. In practice, though, the process for getting citizenship certificates for African Americans is much more difficult um, than for white men for a couple of reasons. One is that African Americans, uh, many of them are going to have more difficulty producing the kinds of evidence of citizenship that white men would have. They're somewhat less likely to have certificates of baptism at hand. Um, They're somewhat less likely to have a kind of community of neighbors who are able to testify in the same way to their, uh, their citizenship. And of course, if they're ex-slaves, as a substantial portion of the free African-American community is in this period, if they're ex-slaves, they're not going to have any of this documentation easily to hand. So in practice, the process is a little bit more difficult, but in theory, it is absolutely the same. So let me just say one more thing about African-Americans and the Siemens Protection Certificate. One of the most amazing 
moments for me in working on this project was rediscovering, because I had read about this before, but I, I had forgotten about it, rediscovering the role that they played in the life of Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass, as some of you probably know, was one of the leading abolitionist orators of the 19th century, probably the leading African-American abolitionist orator and thinker of the 19th century. And he was born a slave in Maryland and escaped from slavery in 1838 after a couple of earlier attempts. And his successful attempt to escape from slavery took place in 1838 with the help of one of these Seaman's certificate. In his autobiography published shortly after his escape, he said, I can't really tell you how I escaped, but in the revised version published later, when it was safer to reveal these, these facts, he reveals that he escaped from slavery in part by borrowing a citizenship certificate from an African-American sailor and using that as proof of his status as a free black man. And that's what allowed him to get out of Baltimore, which is where he was at the time, and make his way to New York and from there to New Bedford and begin this career. So these certificates have real power, even in 1838, which is much later than the, the American Revolutionary period, but I'm focused on. Even that late, when you know Amer racism against African Americans in the United States is really profound, even then these citizenship certificates have the power in certain circumstances to protect the citizenship of an African American. Nathan, this has been a fascinating conversation, but it's already time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if France had not had its revolution and gone to war with Great Britain? How would the development of American citizenship identification documents have changed? And would the development of this paperwork have been necessary if France and Great Britain had not been impressing American sailors? This is such a great time warp question because it brings to the fore one of the kind of central arguments of the book, which is that American sailors in this period aren't some exception to the rule. They're just the first people who kind of enter into the modern relationship that we have between subjects or citizens and a state. And so I think the answer to the question is we would still probably arrive at some version of what we have today, which is to say uh, a world in which nationality matters tremendously, right? Where nationality is what gives you all sorts of rights and where your nationality has to be proven by paper. I mean, every one of you probably has in your pocket or your wallet or your purse some kind of national identity document. And it so happens that because American sailors in the 1790s and early 1800s face these extraordinary pressures to prove themselves to be American citizens, nationals, that they became the first to have these citizenship certificates. And that might not have happened for sailors if the Revolutionary Wars hadn't happened. But I still think we probably would have arrived at this world of, sort of modern world of citizenship documentation. It probably just wouldn't have been sailors who would have been the first to have it. What aspect of early American history are you working on now? Are you going to continue with researching maritime life? So no, I'm actually working now on a book that's going to be a cultural history of the Age of Revolutions. And really, in essence, this book is going to try to pull together a story about the Age of Revolution from, as you said, the American Revolution through the beginning of the Latin American Revolution as a world that's connected transnationally, not by political ideas, so much as shared cultural practices around politics. So shared ideas about sociability, shared forms of communication. Um, and so by doing that, I hope to rethink a little bit what the Age of Revolutions is really about. And where is the best place to look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we still have questions about citizenship and early American maritime life? You can find me on the USC Dornsif History Department website. Uh, have a homepage there with all the information. And uh, the best way to reach me is my email address, which is pearlrose, P-E-R-L-R-O-S-E -E, at usc.edu. Nathan, thank you so much for helping us explore citizenship and maritime life in the Atlantic world during the Age of Revolution. Thank you, Liz. I really appreciate it. Citizenship and proving that you were a citizen of a particular nation mattered to those who sailed the high Atlantic seas during the Age of Revolutions. As Nathan revealed, prior to the American Revolution, sailors proved citizenship by language and dress. 
If you spoke English, you were British. If you spoke French, you were French. But the American Revolution threw a wrench into this common sense notion of citizenship. American independence meant that if you spoke English, you could be a citizen of Great Britain or of the United States. How was a profit-hungry privateer or a law-abiding government official supposed to know who was whom? Thanks largely to the American maritime community, the United States government developed a solution. Government-issued citizenship certificates. These certificates allowed ship captains and government officials to determine citizenship through paperwork. If a sailor carried a citizenship document from the United States, then they were likely to be a citizen. But just as in our own day, some sailors and non-sailors use these documents to commit fraud. As Nathan pointed out, sailors would lose their documents and request new ones. Non-American sailors might find one of these lost documents and use it to their advantage. Still, these government-issued certificates proved to be state-of-the-art for their day, and they ultimately paved the way for the forms of photo identification we carry around with us in our wallets. You can find more information about Nathan, his book, Citizen Sailors, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 076. Did you listen to this episode through the Ben Franklin's World app? The app is free and it allows you to do cool things like tweet or Facebook post your favorite episodes. Check out the show notes page or send me an email with just a couple of clicks right from the app. You can download the Ben Franklin's World app from your favorite mobile device app store or by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash apps. Finally, what aspect of maritime life or citizenship during the age of revolutions did you find most fascinating? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.